Okay, I start this uh, in Nordic Innovation kickoff, the first part, the plenary session. My name is Lena Henriksson, and by my side I have Svein Berg, uh, CEO at uh, Nordic Innovation. Uh, this is a very special day for us here at Nordic Innovation, and we really welcome all of you who are with us. We will take uh, up this uh, first 45 minutes, so if there's someone who wants to see it later, you can always watch it uh, uh, from our YouTube uh, site, or we can send it to you. Uh, there's no time for questions, really, but uh, after the speech of Dan Hill, uh, you can uh, send us questions in the chat group, and you can do that during all the meeting, and we will catch up the questions later, so we can take them after this meeting. Um, I think uh, we will start uh, with a short film, only two minutes, so uh, bear with it. And it's a film from the Nordic Ministers, uh, Council of Ministers, and it uh, was the film that launched the eight action plans decided by the Nordic Ministers for Industry and Innovation in September this year. So we watched the movie. Þessar áallanir eru öflug verkfæri til þess að endurreisa hægkerfið með vistvænum hætti eftir COVID-19 heimsfaraldurinn. Kyseessä ovat kestävän kehityksen painottuvat pohjoismaiset taloitteet, joiden on määrä auttaa yrityksiä harjoittamaan liiketoimia yli rajoja. Här är några exempel på hva vi sammen ønsker å oppnå. Lastbilar och skip i norr London skulle kunna bruka gröna orsko. Vi vill göra det lättare att fylla sig orskorna av i alla London. Som konsument ska du kunna följa de metaller du har i dina elektroniska apparater eller för den delen i solceller så att du vet hur de är utvunna, att de är utvunna på ett hållbart och etiskt sätt så att du kan känna dig trygg med att du bidrar till en hållbar framtid. Sen att ni är tappade kul, än att ni är som att ni är rappigt där jag rappar. När jag rappar ut så är det bistå kärnor, då slår jag sannar att jag rappar ut. Så du får rappar ut i minut är det sin som är att ni är sitt och gott där jag rappar. Med ny teknik, digitalisering, datainsamling har vi stora möjligheter att kunna gå över från en linjär modell till en cirkulär modell. Våra företag ska slippa rapportera manuellt till myndigheterna. Det ska ske automatiskt. Och vi ska kunna byta data smidigt över gränserna för nya, smarta, innovativa verksamhetslösningar. Samman ska vi lägga grundlaget för nya IT- och datalösningar för att göra Norden världsledande inom hälsoteknologi och life science. Och självklart ska vi vara ta personvärnet. Näringsministrarnas åtta initiativ är en kraftfull satsning mot en starkare... ...och integrerade region 2030. Thank you for watching. Uh, I will turn to Sven. Um, now that you have seen and heard the ministers uh, for innovation and businesses talk about the new eight action plans. What is your take on it? Um, I would um, make three reflections. The first one is that uh, the ministers uh, have decided on eight action plans. And that is good because a clear decision on the eight action plans is something we can work in realizing. My second point will be that um, the action plans are means uh, to reach the vision 2030 that the Nordics are to become the most sustainable and integrated region globally. That is a, 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 a vision with high ambition and it is a vision which is transformative on a societal level. It means that the action plans that we are to make into programs needs uh, to be just as ambitious, ambitious. And we need to aim for, for, for putting content which make changes on a societal level. The third one is that um, 
when the ministers have come together and decided on the eight action plans. They have done so because they think it makes sense to do it together on a Nordic level. By pooling the resources together, we are able to reach Nordic added value, which is a, an end that not one of the Nordic countries can do alone. It is by coming together, we are able to, to achieve something which we otherwise wouldn't be able to achieve by our, ourselves. So um, what would you say is uh, the purpose of this meeting today? I think the group of um, higher civil servants for industry, also known as uh, EKN, has made it quite clear. And that is, um, they have asked us to transform the eight action plans into program. And that is the work that we start today. So um, if we talk a little bit about Nordic innovation and um, what kind of organization we are, what would you say and how could you explain it for all the people now listening to us? Uh, Nordic innovation is an organization under or owned by the Nordic Council of Ministers. I think our bylaws state it quite clear. That is that uh, Nordic innovation is to contribute in making uh, the Nordics a front runner when it comes to sustainable development through innovation, entrepreneurship, and strengthened competitiveness among Nordic companies. We initiate processes, we bring people together across the Nordics, and we give some financial support to projects which aim to realize our mission. Okay, thank you, Sein. This was uh, a short beginning and introduction to us at Nordic Innovation. And um, just to uh, inspire us all to these four new years with so many exciting um, things that we can do together in the Nordic countries, I would like to introduce a very special person from Vinova, Dan Hill, Director of Strategic Design uh, at Vinova. Uh, and Dan, are you with us? I think you will take over the screen and show us some PowerPoint I while am. you would do to speak. Can you hear me? I am. Yes. And can you hear yes. me okay? Perfect. Welcome. You will give a short introduction to the world of strategic design and mission oriented innovation. Absolutely. And I would tell all, and I just want to tell the people that um, if you want to ask Don something, you can write it in the chat and I will pick up three questions at the end. So we can have some kind of a little bit of discussions before we continue. Okay. On um, one thing, Lena, I think you need to give me screen sharing access. It says the uh, the host needs to um, enable screen sharing for me. But while you're doing that, I will just quickly say hello to everybody. Um, I'm not a very special person at all, <laughs> despite that nice introduction. Um, I'm just a, a normal person, I guess, as we all are, but um, I'm a director of strategic design at Vinova. Vinova, I'm sure most of you know, is the Swedish government innovation agency. I've been in Sweden for about uh, 20 months now, as you can probably tell by my voice, I'm not Swedish originally. And um, my colleagues on the call, Andreas and Daniel, I can see you there, there's probably others will know full well that my Swedish is terrible still. So apologies. Um, I used to work at Citra in Finland about 10 years ago, so I have a bit of uh, Nordic experience, at least across two countries and worked across many others. Um, okay, now I can share the screen. Thank you. Um, can you see this? Whoops. Okay, let me just... There you go. Can someone give me a thumbs up that they can see that image? Yep, thank you. So um, I'm going to give a, a very quick kind of whirl around some of the work I've been doing with my colleagues here at Vinova um, and some of the background to that, I guess, around this idea of strategic design and how the agency is exploring um, different ways of doing innovation, ways that don't replace our existing models, to be clear, but perhaps augment them and extend them into new directions. And my background very briefly is as a designer and um, I guess I suppose you might say innovator, as in I, I tend to work on projects like these, these kind of large urban scale development projects in Amsterdam or Sydney or the, the Google campus in California or, or cell phone projects like Punkt that make Switzerland make 
in the bottom right there, which is a, a cell phone that doesn't use data. It's just a phone. <laughs> so it's not a smartphone on purpose. Um, so I, I, that is also innovative, by the way, but in a very interesting way. You can come back to that. Or Sheffield, you see in the middle there, or the new V&A building. Those, I, that's my sort of milieu um, and doing work in that area. But usually I'm working in the context of the public sector or the public innovation around it. So that's enough about me. Um, just a brief story to start with. Uh, you can probably see this little attic I'm in in the background here, this very sort of um, Dalena style attic from the 1890s or something. Actually, I'm sitting in a house, not one of these houses, but in Equator in, in Stockholm, which some of you might know is a garden city model. It was laid out in about 1905, 1907 to garden city principles. And it kind of works incredibly well now as an innovative urban plan, I must say. It has a lot of the ingredients that we would describe in a good sustainable innovation project these days. Um, urban agriculture, active transport, healthy outdoor living, green and blue infrastructure, um, public transport linked to the city center. All of those things were there in 1905 and they're still here now, more or less. Um, but what happened actually after this in about 1930 is that you started seeing things like this. These are stills from a movie that I, I'd show you if the bandwidth could rely on to hold up, but I'll, um, I can send this movie around afterwards. It's worth watching. It's a Swedish newsreel, but it effectively works as a propaganda film for cars. It basically says, Don Sogor i vegan, as in uh, those who get in the way. And it's talking about um, kids playing in the street and this uh, old guy in the middle of the of Kungsholm and there, or no, Kungsgatan actually. Um, or this guy walking out into the road while reading his paper, or these two ladies having a chat in the road. And it's basically saying to them, get out of the road because new technology is coming. New technology is the car in this case, and the streets are now for cars. And I'm using this as a kind of, literally as an example of a, a, a problematic shift. And then also metaphorically as what happens when you do innovation with technology to the fore, and you don't think about people and place enough. And of course, that led to uh, Sweden being Europe's car densest land by about 1955, um, and a sort of the beer lifestyle emerging there in good ways and bad ways, I'd say in the end, largely bad, but let's just assume there were some good points as well. And, um, and then uh, that nice urban plan I showed you got sliced apart by this in 1958, uh, a major sort of six to eight lane highway, Nunesvegen. Um, which again would have produced some economic growth, no doubt, but I can tell you living next to it, or at least a couple of blocks away from it, the, the decibel level is about 85 decibels at times. I mean, it's deeply problematic for anybody living in what was previously was almost one of Europe's leading examples of garden cities. So we have this really problematic challenge that when we jump on a technology without thinking enough about the context, and so this is what now that garden city looks like, which doesn't look like, much like a garden, at least at that point of the inquiry. And you see the same thing, frankly, now, Uber and Lyft um, and ride-sharing companies, when not thought about holistically, often make things worse, just by not any evil intent on their part, just through the application of a technology without it being in a broader context. So Uber and Lyft increased traffic delays in San Francisco by as much as 40% in a city with already a traffic problem. And it's not, again, uh, specifically a challenge at the level of the application. Uh, the app itself is well designed. As you know, the machine learning in it is exemplary. It works incredibly well. The issue is what happens when you scale that up to society, or in this case, a city. So we have the starting point. Technology is the answer, but what was the question? Which was a phrase that Cedric Price said in 1966. And we don't really ask that enough still these days. But we're asking it now, and we're asking it at Vinova. So um, uh, we're putting it in this broader context of understanding we need to look at the way that we do innovation. Madeleine Albright's quote from a few years ago under a very different American administration. We'll, get, we'll see today, I guess, what American administration we get next. But when she was around, um, she made it very clear, not just talking about America, but Western models in general, I guess, maybe Eastern as well. But 21st century challenges, climate crisis, public health, social justice, can't be addressed with the same tools that created them one way or another. So these issues that we know are utterly interlinked, utterly systemic, dependent across each other, do not fall neatly onto ministries organized into separate boxes with agencies underneath them. It just, that just cannot work anymore. 
hence all of the issues we see in those areas. So we have to innovate how we innovate. And that means looking at the way that we do innovation itself. And it's just, let's talk about now about mission-oriented innovation, because I work very much at Vinovo again with my colleagues on mission-oriented innovation, what that might mean. I'm also a visiting professor at UCL working with Mariana Mazzucato and uh, the filling out the idea of missions, really, how you put it into practice. And some people think with mission that it's about setting a target. And I argue it's not really about setting a target. We have a lot of targets already. These are all the UN SDG sub goals and other 17 major goals. We already have about nine years to get this lot done. Um, we have Nordic level targets. We have European level targets. We have country level targets, city level targets. Um, the issue are always action. How do we get things done? We have lots of plans. The issue is action again. So pulling plans and delivery together and beginning to focus more on the delivery action end of it and building policy out of that, that's probably a more contemporary way to address the challenge. So how do we get as close to the ground as possible and see what innovation feels like there? That's very different to the work that I did with Mariana actually on the UK industrial strategy, which was relatively, it was a good piece of work, I think, but um, in a traditional model. So when we got to Sweden, uh, we wanted to look at how do we do this innovation practice on the ground in a highly collaborative learning through doing approach. And again, thanks to my colleagues of Innova for really helping deliver on this, get this done. Um, one of the first things we did was we look at the difference between enablers and outcomes. So we did some quick work about a year ago, looking at some example candidate mission themes, these things in pink here, like carbon positive consumption, as in carbon neutral, um, or healthy, sustainable food or preventative health. And they're unlocked by enablers and the blue things there are the enablers, the public sector, the private sector, social innovation, connected industry, so industry 4.0, basically trusted services, AI, machine learning, all of those things are an enabler. They're not an outcome in themselves. And you have to be careful about those because machine learning, for instance, could be useful or useless. <laughs> it depends on what you do with it. As we saw with the Uber and Lyft example, it can make things much worse or it can make things better, but you need to apply it to some outcome there. So that's what the pink stuff is about. So then we said, okay, let's test. And we chose a couple of those and uh, we threw the missions practice at it. So Mariana's model for missions is on the left there, very simple, grand challenge, turn it into a mission, align a set of sectors around that. So it's properly cross sector. You can't work with sectors anymore, really one by one, because they don't really exist. They're artificial constructs, but they don't really map onto systems. So make them work towards a mission. And then they do that through multiple projects joined together. And you see the text on the right, very simple definition again, um, but keywords there, bold inspiration with wide societal relevance. So societal relevance is to the fore. That's the key thing here. So often get what gets used is the Apollo mission as an example, land a man on the moon by the end of this decade. I'd argue that's not the best example personally. The times are very different. That was a very binary political condition there. And it was almost a race with the Soviets, as you know, um, that, that we're not in that world quite anymore. Um, well, some people maybe think we are, but we're perhaps in a very different form of collaboration and politics right now. Um, and equally, this was a technical mission, really. It didn't take huge social innovation lots of technology there, which is impressive and, and had good outcomes in society later, it had a good spillover. But in itself, our, lesson, our missions are more complex these days. So maybe a better analogy is things like Million Program at the uh, Swedish mission for building housing, it's public houses from 1965 to 1974, a million affordable new dwellings. This was achieved, which is kind of extraordinary. You could say with good and bad outcomes, as you can imagine, we wouldn't do it in exactly the same way now. But some of these buildings are perfectly tailor-made for the next 50 years as well as the last 50 years with a bit of retrofit. Um, interestingly, New Zealand just tried to do 100,000 houses in 10 years and gave up saying it was too ambitious. And then New Zealand was about 5 million, 6 million. Sweden was about 7 million, 8 million in the 60s through the 70s. So roughly the same size. So it's kind of extraordinary within the Nordics we have these stories. You will have them in also in Iceland and Greenland and Finland and Denmark and Norway, obviously. Vision Zero is another interesting one. Um, so again, a great mission and has been achieved perhaps most successfully recently in Oslo, where last year they effectively had no pedestrian deaths, I believe, from traffic accidents at all. So it was achieved in a sense. But getting it to achieve more broadly is much harder than a technical challenge. And critics of Vision Zero have said this has been approached as a technical challenge and it's made car driving safer. 
but it hasn't made cycling necessarily safer or walking, for instance, actually. So unless you actually remove things uh, and shift mobility patterns, as Oslo has demonstrated, then you will always have this stubborn residual level of car traffic accidents as we do in Sweden. So we wanted to open up the question. And so we went through this amazingly um, hard work, but very interesting work of going across now probably 500 different organizations and working with mobility and food as candidate missions, figuring out what to do here. Let's have a blank canvas approach to addressing the problem systemically. And those organizations are frontline actors. And so the first thing we did in this process was look at the angles involved in uh, looking at an area like healthy, sustainable mobility. What are the intervention points, the acupuncture points, if you like? And the same with healthy, sustainable food. And then we've gone through this process, which I'll come on to briefly. So this is shifting then from angles to action over time, moving from stakeholders pointing towards citizens and moving from sectors towards places and systems. And our, our question to ourselves is how, we, how do we learn as much as possible from this process? And it was fascinating to work with people here. And these are all again, frontline actors. You see people here from um, local public transport agencies, Ericsson R&D, the Swedish food sector, the, the national government, research agencies, startups, large companies, people running health departments in regional health authorities and so on. We went to the people on the ground getting things done or trying to and understood what do you think we need to do? And it's a very kind of humble question in that direction. And, and we looked at the way that we did that, how we got people to collaborate. I could talk forever about those participation models. We got them out walking and observing the city in different ways, much more engaged and hands-on. This is well before you get to anything like a call or process. This is understanding what is the question in the first place? What do we do calls around? And the agents here is acting as the glue in this sense. We need a knowledge of the systems and contact with them. But it's really going to people and saying, you in effect tell us what needs to happen and then assembling a collective picture out of that. We have built a team for this kind of thing internally working across our colleagues. We looked at the existing research going on in different sectors. Uh, we see gaps between national, regional, municipal roadmaps there. You can see a very siloed work. None of this would be any surprise to anybody. And this isn't a criticism of Sweden at all. Um, we're as good or bad, as bad as anybody in this sense. Coming out of this, you end up with these kind of angles for intervention, which fall out the, those workshops quite clearly, actually. We also did lots of interviews and one-on-one -on -one bilateral meetings, research as well. And we get this thing called a system canvas, which gives us uh, basically an idea, where do we intervene in the system? Where is the angle of attack in this? They, they took a lot of synthesis down, as you can see. Again, we did this internally and externally, as our colleagues have been over in the bottom right. Uh, you see these big messy maps. These then get spread out. I won't go into the detail just because we're going to have time. I'm happy to share any of this with people afterwards, by the way. Looking at push and pull. So technology push requires also societal pull and vice versa. So these are separating our end to push and pull across food and mobility here. So for instance, we can produce electric car charge points for cars, but we also need a demand for electric cars charge points. So how do you create the demand and the supply at the same time, enabling you to shape the overall picture? We can move more quickly, it can be cheaper, it can be better that way. So a key insight coming out of this stuff actually was interesting. And this, we, and to be clear, we went to technology firms, R&D labs and others, and, the, and the message was we have almost all of the technology we need for almost any version of the European Green Deal. You can imagine we have almost, almost all of it. Not all of it, but almost all of it. So that's not to say that we don't need to do blue sky research. We need to invest obviously in things like electric aviation where we don't have any real roadmap for the next decade or so. But a lot of the other stuff we have closer to the ground and it's the innovation then is in getting it done. That is as innovative as the stuff in the lab to be clear, if not more innovative, I would argue. The stuff in the lab is inventive. The innovative stuff is getting it done on the ground. Business models, behavior change, policy change, regulation. So moving then into the missions, we started looking at the systemic things underlying some of the areas that were beginning to emerge as intervention points, streets, electricity grids, school food, looking at these things as systems, how do they relate to each other? Um, we worked with other folk like this, CITRA have been a big influence, Climate Kick and others, UNDP, I think are really interesting, and this blue text here, how do you create a mechanism that resolves uncertainty as it goes, was our key question, which is really powerful thought for us. 
So we said, how quickly can we get into these kind of environments and start producing innovation within them and in collaboration with actors on the ground? So street, retail, neighborhood and grid on the mobility side and on the food side, farming and food systems like new types of food, food retail, school food and others. And these are then kind of clusters of projects which we can form into missions. And we look at systemic change principles to enable them to scale. So as opposed to just doing one-offs on the ground, then the question is, okay, how do they then scale up? Good question. So then we look at things like a platform strategy. We have work on the ground. Let's say that's a chunk of Stockholm or Oslo at the, the top of the picture there, or Reykjavik or whatever. They're all different. Reykjavik is different to Oslo. But underneath that, there's some very consistent layers, actually, potentially quite consistent layers of law and policy and financing, particularly across the Nordics. Data and code could be very similar, standards and guidelines. You know, the huge value in making a lot of those things quite consistent. And of course, this is how contemporary platform strategies work. Your phones in your pockets, we all have actually quite similar phones, I would guess. There'll be a few differences there, but uh, you have massive diversity as what you have on your phone. Billions of apps, you know, you can have Super Mario Brothers or LinkedIn, it doesn't, it's up to you, right? But they sit on very consistent stacks underneath and that's how it scales. Hardware is roughly the same, physics is exactly the same. But the operating system is only two or three of those. So those are really consistent and coherent, but they enable that diversity above. So we took the same model and said, okay, how do you look at something like the streets? The street is a complex system. It's not about traffic. It never has been about traffic. Well, only in the last two generations has it been about traffic, but we've given it to traffic to look after. If you give the traffic department the streets, then you get traffic, the clue is in the name. If you give the street to gardeners, you get gardens, right? The challenge is how do you produce multiple outcomes out of something complex like the street or a school or a port or a forest? So we put multiple things out multiple things in sorry to get multiple things out that's where we're heading towards and then this enables us to start looking at um, the balance of those things do you want the street to produce environmental quality and public health and resilient business then in that case then there's a very different street to one built around cars just to be clear so then we did these kind of workshops working with people on the ground again these are people closer and closer including citizens actually coming to these workshops sometimes we unlock their thinking a bit with stories from the near future. We get them to finish these stories. So we engage in some speculative fiction pieces. We look at other projects in the world like Paris's 15 minute city and so on. Uh, we get them drawing in very synthetic ways, but again, working in collaborative groups. So again, we're, we're just being the glue here as Vinova. Um, people I can say turned up hugely for this stuff. We didn't pay anybody to come. <laughs> Uh, no doubt people were sometimes coming because of the innovation funding agency in some people's heads, but, but really saying, well, no, with the innovation agency, we're help, we want you to help us frame the challenge. That was what got things done. So let me get to the point and then I'll finish and we can have some, I'll look at the chat. <laughs> um, so where we got to next was, okay, let's get to prototypes quickly. And coming out of those workshops, again, all of the ideas that people had, we synthesized together. And the mission then, for instance, with streets is ensure that Every street in Sweden is healthy, sustainable, and vibrant. Every street, because it's a social justice issue, we can't pick some nice streets over some other bad streets. If they're places where people live, everybody has a right to healthy, sustainable, and vibrant. So that's a direction. And then we can get into the targets in a moment. We look again at the system underneath that. What does healthy, sustainable, and vibrant mean? Those are very high level terms and those very complex things underneath that. So we revel in that complexity, no problem. There's lots of people that can do that. We looked at existing projects, these pink and blue things down the bottom that we could align around this new mission. So there were a couple in Vinova's portfolio already, which we could put next to each other, and we created a new one. We worked with Stockholm Stad, the municipality, who were working on some street retrofits and said, okay, let's join forces here as well. And now we have also Umeå, Helsingborg, Malmö, Gothenburg, and others coming on board. So these are kind of classic streets that you see in the middle of Stockholm, actually. I'd say completely dead, to be honest. There's a school next to them, but they're basically being used as parking lots. As you see, there's no real life there, but it's right in the middle of Stockholm. So we then made the designers of those streets, the school children. So the school children that are in the school next to the street, they're the best people to design a street, actually, it turns out. This is then a model for diversity. The street designs its own street, enables you to produce a very diverse system in this way. And they did this super well. 
We also did the same technique with the Stats Minister, by the way. I won't tell you who was better at this, the Prime Minister or the kids, but you can imagine. Um, and then these are the designs the kids came up with, and then they're turned into modular, extendable things, what, almost like a boardwalk, basically, working with ARCDES, the National Centre for Architecture and Design, Lombardy Design, who did these lovely designs here, white architecture, Sweco, and others were involved in the previous stage with the school kids as well as Stockholm Stad. So these are extensible units designed to sit in parking bays and slowly begin to, to enable us to take a half step towards retrofitting the street. Designed like a boardwalk so it can extend. We all know that boardwalks work okay in winter as well as in summer. They're made from Swedish timber, so we're kind of softening the landscape of the street but using circular materials in this sense. Um, they then turn into real designs like this, um, and then they're opened here by the Deputy Mayor of Stockholm. Uh, there's our Philip knocking over school children in the foreground on the right. Um, and uh, this is the kind of thing you can see they're beginning to solve the scooter problem, bike parking, they're adding social spaces to the streets, they're building relationships with um, shops and cafes and beginning to uh, change the way the street feels quite radically, so we're talking about the way that does for their business. Um, it greens the street, it gives people a place to sit and so on. And we have this value model underneath that. All of the, you can't read all of this, so apologies, but all of these white things here linked to SDGs are outcomes. So they are all things like, if I zoom in a bit, um, increase in local biodiversity leads to decrease in urban heat island effect. Increase in green spaces encourages people to walk and keep walking. Reduction in motor vehicle use decreases microplastics. Increase in birdsong due to decrease in traffic noise leads to increase in mental health. There's research in all of these areas that are never usually combined into one, one project like this. Uh, property value increases, commercial value, footfall, shops do better. It's multiple, multiple types of outcomes. So again, not approach to silos and sectors, but as one thing, because the street is one thing. That enables them to scale out of that. So it's building a value model enables us to guide that. That's collective value, all of the interventions there. We can use that as a compass to steer the mission. And then finally, I'll just wrap up by saying that we've done some surveys now 300 surveys last week, um, and people are 70 to 75% positive about these changes, which is kind of extraordinary, given that we're taking car parking away. <laughs> I say we, Stockholm Star is taking it. Um, usually when you take car parking away in urban projects, you get death threats. So to get 70% was a very good outcome. And that's some, that's some price. And the final thing I'll just say is we lined up the system behind this to enable it to scale. So you have all of these questions across different layers here physical skills, standards, data, all the things I showed you in the platform strategy earlier. And then these are all the different partners involved underneath that, from Transport Sterilis and the Transport Regulatory Authority who run the parking space law, through to Bouverket and the Stockholm region and so on, all the way uh, Ericsson and Boy and Volvo Cars and others, all partners on this project. So I think I'll stop there because I just wanted to show you, here's how you do a kind of, or at least in Sweden, how we've done one version of a collaboration process around missions, starting with a blank canvas and getting to action in the streets, producing multiple outcomes from multiple players in the line. And Vinova's role there, my colleagues like Andreas and Daniel on the, on the call as well, have just been the glue that we've facilitated that process. And it's taken some funding, but actually I think our action has been the most powerful thing there. So it implies maybe a different kind of role for agencies in this world, which is far more engaged and participative. Um, that project now can scale. There's actually 40,000 kilometers of street like that in Sweden. Um, we built more parking space than we had living space. <laughs> 55 square meters per person as opposed to 40 square meters of living space. So we have all of the room to scale that out now, having built those first prototypes. But I think I will leave it there. Um, and I'll hand back to the studio, wherever you are, Lena. Thank you, Don, for this insightful and inspirational presentation. We actually have a question from Christine from Norway. And she says, I think part of what you are saying is that there is an entrepreneurship element to innovation in getting this done. You show examples of public innovation, but how do you find that you promote or inspire entrepreneurship within the public sector? What would you say about um, that, Dan? Yeah, I mean, I, I think also Mariana Matsukata's work is a lot about that. That's, that's why I work with her. Um, and as you can see, a lot of that, the, the street is run by things like the public sector. So unless there's enough innovation entrepreneurship on that side, 
we don't get to do anything interesting with the street, frankly, no matter how innovative the private sector is. So we have to join those things together. And as I pointed out briefly at the end there, we're having Voy, the scooter company, Volvo Cars, uh, Volvo M, the car sharing company, Ericsson R&D, that was fundamental to have them as partners in the project. But unless we have Stockholm Stad, the municipality, Stockholm Region, who run the healthcare and the public transport and Transport Sturluson, who own the parking space law, we don't get to do any innovation in those spaces, no matter how good Voy or Volvo are. So it's really saying that the street is a way of just gluing those things together. It gives us a, uh, a system to work with. And then our job is to bring all of the sectors into place simultaneously into it to see it as a shared outcome. So entrepreneurship runs across the board there, whether it's Stockholm Star Traffic Contora or Voy. Yeah, well, thank you, Don. Uh, you talk about uh, a lot about target policies, enablers, outcome, and a lot about delivering. Uh, what do you say that we need to deliver at, as Nordic Innovation? Sure. Um, I, I mean, in particular, I think how we work as a system across our shared cultures, I think would be really interesting to look at because the same project that I just showed you is also happening in different ways in Oslo, Helsinki, Reykjavik, uh, you know, just obviously in Copenhagen in different ways again, um, as well as all of the other cities that aren't capital cities, apologies. <laughs> um, so there are, there's a massive value in having a shared response across that, literally some of the systems and policies could be shared at some level. As I showed with the example of the smartphone, the reason these things are so successful is massive sharing of code and principles and policies within the system. That's how Apple and Android are able to do what they do. There's no reason why we can't think like that at a Nordic level, because we have enough shared values, enough shared interest and outcomes, and also increasingly enough diversity to do the application level, if you like. So I think having Nordic innovation being glue across a regional level and, and helping us deliver stimulated innovations on the ground in our, in our various nations and member states, that would be super interesting. That's beautiful, like a glue then. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, that's great. Uh, a sustainable and, um, glue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sustainable glue and on the Nordic level. So if you exactly. just want to say one more thing about, uh, do you have you seen any Nordic project that you could just, as an example, more than, because now you had a, a kind of a, an example that goes through all the Nordic countries, but maybe focused on Stockholm, but. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, also to be clear, the, the, the street one we're working across now, six or seven different Swedish cities, but of course there's interest from others as well, um, and Oslo in particular. The other big mission we're working on, which I didn't talk about, was school food. And I think food in the Nordics is particularly interesting. And it's how we met, I think, um, Lena and, uh, and a few other people on the call here. So how we, how we begin to work with food systems from understanding that agricultural systems don't fit neatly into national boundaries, interesting challenge, all the way up to things like big systems like school food or public foods. Um, I think, again, we have a lot of that across the region in, in different ways, and those different ways are very useful. So I think that would, finding these things that are cultural as well as economic, as well as social and require technology and innovation all at the same time, that's why I'm interested in things like um, you know, public life on the streets or, or food and any, any one of these are good candidates for working together. Well, thank you, Don. Thank Pleasure. you thank for you. giving us such an interesting presentation and um, we'll hear from you again, I'm sure. Uh, I turn to, to Svein again. Um, a little bit more about Nordic innovation. We are based in Oslo. I'm Swede, you're a Norwegian. <laughs> And can you tell us a little bit more about uh, who we are? Well, we are, as you say, an organization which is based in Oslo. We are 20 employees. Our annual budget is around 100 million Norwegian kroner. Uh, we uh, concentrate and prioritize three main projects, uh, one or program. Uh, uh, one is within health and quality of life. The second one uh, focuses on uh, circular economy and the third one is on mobility but i would like to add something to what dan uh, just elaborated on and um, we are cooperating with um, uh, the nordic smart city network where um, uh, 21 cities are members they have for the last year 
cooperated and identified uh, which common challenges do they see in the Nordic cities. And based on this, they have uh, invited companies uh, into a cooperation where companies uh, develop uh, solutions to the challenges that the cities have uh, uh, identified. And then the cities serves uh, as laboratories for testing out the solutions that the companies are coming up with. And if the solutions are successful, uh, then it will be very fast and efficient to implement the same solutions in the rest of the cities. Oh, that sounds great. We do a lot of things at Nordic Innovation, so just um, contact us uh, to talk about what we do today, but we will continue to talk about tomorrow. So uh, what would you say are the role of the reference group? Now, I think we're around 100 people here listening to us. The role of the reference group, what would you say that is? I would underline five points. The first one is that um, you together represent a huge competence insight in what are the political priorities within each of your countries. That is important that you bring this into the into the discussions. But because remember, we are to develop the, the action plans into programs. And then we need to have the insight uh, on what are the priorities in each country. Uh, the second point I will make is that uh, each of the action plans define the objective. And even though uh, the minister order for growth is going to uh, have a higher budget for the next years, still uh, each action plan will only have annually in average between 14 and 5 million Norwegian kroner. And if we are to prioritize uh, all the ideas which are identified in the action plans, we risk that we are spreading the resources too wide. And consequently, we will not be able to uh, achieve the results if we go out too wide. So you need to help us in identifying which are the main areas where we can together make a difference. And you need to help us in going from having identified uh, the many interesting to what are the vital few areas that we should prioritize. The third one uh, uh, I have touched upon already, but and that is that the vision 2030 to make the Nordic the most integrated and sustainable region. It is a, a vision with high ambition and it has a, 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 an end that is going to transform the society uh, on the Nordic level. And we need also when we are going to develop the programs to have the same ambition. We are to develop programs which can make a difference on a Nordic and societal level. The fourth one I would mention is that there are action plans for the different sectors. We even have cross sectorial action plans. Uh, with your insight, you need to bring with you what are the different initiatives going on in the Nordics so we do avoid uh, overlap and, and rather that we can identify where can we uh, uh, pull the resources together so it makes uh, Nordic added value to work together. And the last one is that we need when we develop the programs also to identify which uh, result uh, indicators are we going to implement, how are we going to measure uh, the, if the programs are going to be su successful. So what do you want to achieve with the, these two, this first plenary uh, meeting and the breakout sessions later? What do you want to achieve today? Uh, first of all, I hope that um, after today, everybody thinks that uh, this has been a good start in the work that we're going to do to develop the action plans into the programs. And secondly, I hope that you all will bring into the breakout sessions later today and your national perspectives, your national priorities, and that you can also identify where do we find synergies between uh, the, the different national priorities. Thank you. And what will happen now? Well, now we are going to have 50, a 15 minutes break. Yeah. After 15 minutes, four of the reference groups will come together and the next four reference groups will come together in one hour and 15 minutes.
Yes, that's great. Uh, we will, um, I hope you uh, all uh, had some uh, inspiration and uh, felt the feeling that all of us at Nordic Innovation feel that we're so happy to be here and to welcome you to our world. And if you want, you can follow us on social media. We are on all platforms. Uh, so just welcome and enjoy the day and don't hesitate to connect to us or ask questions and feel that you're a part of Nordic Innovation. Thank you. Framtiden i de nordiska landene byr på någon stora utfordringar. Vi har en befolkning som blir äldre. En natur som tränger hjälp. Jobber som försvinner. Och nya som må skapas. Utfordringarna vi står overfor kan heldigvis lösas och det gör vi bäst sammen. På uppdrag fra de nordiska näringsministerna har Nordic Innovation fört över 300 ambitiösa bedrifter och organisationer sammen sedan 2018. Ved att förena kloka hoder fra hela Norden skapar vi groben för nya smarta lösningar för vår felles bärkraftiga och integrerade framtid. Hvordan kan vi skapa god mobilitet och livskvalitet i byene utan att gå på bekostning av naturen? Hvordan kan industrin ta form som ett cirkulärt kretslöp hvor resurserna utnyttjas bedre? Och hvordan ska färre händer ta vare på flere och flere äldre människor? Disse frågorna och många fler trenger innovativa svar. Därför gör vi det möjligt att dela erfarenheter, kunskap och idéer mellan alla de nordiska länderna. Slik finner vi lösningarna vi trenger raskare och slik kan vi sammen leda Norden in i framtiden. Nordic Innovation, powering collaboration for great ideas. <laughs>